second talk, right? After the um, yeah. So, th well, thanks very much. Very pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. So every everyone was there. So everyone's no, seen no, the. No. Ah, you're <laughs> not there. Yeah. Okay, a couple people were not there. So please, please ask questions. I'll go through the first bit very quite quickly. But and everyone, please do do ask if if you don't don't if I don't define things. Uh, right, so this is all joint work with my uh, PhD student Marcelo Campos, who just defended recently and will go to to Cambridge next year. Uh, Simon Griffiths, uh, my long-time collaborator who works in Bookie Hill, uh, and uh, Julian's Haz Rabude, uh, who was a uh, postdoc in, in IMPA and, and the last few years has been a, a lecturer in, in Cambridge. Uh, so I was uh, very lucky to work with these three very brilliant people on this, on this project. Um, OK, so let me tell you the, a brief interruption. So let me tell you the definitions. So the Ramsey number, RK. Right, is the minimum <coughs> n such that for every colouring of the edges of the complete graph with two colours, which I'm going to call red and blue, there exists a, a monochromatic copy of KK, so a monochromatic clique on, on K vertices. Okay. And this is a so Ramsey. First person to study this in 1930, he showed that the Ramsey number is finite for every k, uh, and then Ebish and Sekeresh, in a, in a famous paper, Sekeresh, in 1935, showed the Ramsey number is, uh, is less than uh, 2k choose k, which is less than 4 to the k. Okay, so we'll start by just uh, reminding you of this proof. Perhaps I'll put it over here, and then we'll have it for later. So what's the picture? So proof. Maybe Sekeresh. So I'm going to want to have a picture like this. I have some red and blue. Wonderful. So I'm going to have a red clique and a blue clique. We're going to call A and B. And the set X is just going to be the intersection of the red neighborhoods of the vertices in A with the intersection of the blue neighborhoods of the vertices in B. So it will always look like this. And one step of the process is to pick a vertex, little x, inside big X. And then X is partitioned into the red neighbors of X and the blue neighbors of X. You look at whichever one of these is bigger, it looks like here is this one's bigger. So then you put x into a, add x to a, and the new x is then this set here. Okay, so you throw away all the blue neighbors. So what happens in each step? So x decreases by a factor of 2 in each step at most. So x is at least 2 to the minus size of a minus size of b times x. You just keep doing this until you run out of vertices. So you run out of vertices when this thing hits 1, I guess. So what does this say? It says you can continue it. So let's say <coughs> it's equal to 1. That means the size of A plus the size of B. So if it's a raise, so if n is at least 4 to the k, implies that uh, a plus b is at least 2k, which implies that the maximum of a and b is at least k. So we found a monochromatic clique of size k, which is what we wanted. OK, so very good. So please, please do ask questions if anything is, if anything is ever unclear. Uh, okay, so that's very nice. Uh, what order am I supposed to do? What am I doing here? Okay, so there's an upper bound. And then Erdős famously, in 1947, 
proved uh, the lower bound of k is greater than root 2 to the k. Okay, so maybe we'll just run through the proof of that very quickly as well. What's the proof? Proof is just color randomly. Okay. So just for each, each edge, toss a coin, a fair coin, independently, is your color. And, uh, and so there could be some distribution over all colorings, which is just the uniform distribution. Every coloring has equal probability. So how do we control such a, so I think it's only right x to be the number of monochromatic copies of kk. We say, all right, so look at the expectation of x. Well, that's just the sum over all copies of kk, or n choose k, just choose k vertices of the probability that each one is monochromatic. Well, what's the probability that a guy is monochromatic? Well, it's a half to the power of the number of edges. All the edges have to be the same. Ah, except there are two colors, uh, so times two. Right? This is the probability they're all red, and this is also the probability they're all blue. OK, so how are we going to bound this thing? Well, the standard bounds. So this is the most e n over k to the k, uh, and this is two to the minus k minus one over two to the k, okay times two, whatever. And now n we said was root two to the k, which is two to the k over two. So this cancels. N cancels with this guy, and we're left with. Constant, constant over k. This is less than one if k is bigger than five, say. Okay. So the ex the expected value x is strictly less than one. So what does that tell you? This is the average. It's the average of x, and x is always. I mean, it's a it's a number of something. So it's, it's a non-negative integer. So the average is strictly less than 1, it must sometimes be 0. And if it's 0 just once, that's a colouring with no monochromatic kk. And so that shows the Ramsey number is at least this. OK? Everyone happy? Great. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. OK. So that was the situation in 1947. Mentioned some improvements. Uh, so, I guess the first one is Spencer in the in the seventies, who improved the lower bound by a factor of two. Oops, <coughs> using the lower local lemma. Uh, Thomason. In 88, the upper bound uh, divided by, so times 1 over root k using quasi randomness. Conlon in 2009, maybe, upper bound times. Uh, so a super polynomial bound, so exponential minus log k squared over log log k. So again, what's randomness? And recently, SAR 3, upper bound, <coughs> e to the minus log k squared. Again, what's randomness? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to use it at all in this talk. Uh, so you don't really need to know what it is. But um, basically, what Thomason said was anything, any colouring that gets close to this <coughs> upper bound has to look sort of random like in various senses. 
So the degrees should all be roughly the same. If the degrees are different, then you win something. The, the co-degree should be the same. Um, and so what he actually took advantage of was, uh, was uh, an, a result of Goodman, who showed at some point, I'm not sure what year, that if you want to sort of minimize the number of monochromatic triangles in a coloring of the complete graph, the best way to do it is just to color randomly. So Goodman, to minimize this, you color, you color randomly. It gives you an S and in the best. Um, and so Thomas and Schoen, basically, if you're uh, sort of took advantage of, of this to, to try to sort of take, instead of taking one step at a time, to take sort of two steps. Um, and it's, it's actually quite, quite complicated and clever how the proof works. It's sort of not, it, I would really like to sort of have a, a nice way of presenting this proof, and it's, it's, not, super, it's not super easy to do. And Conlon's is, is sort of then the same thing, but much more complicated. And then Sari like optimized everything. So this is also like super complicated and, and, and extremely clever. Um, but yeah, you really need to be very close to this upper bound to, to get this le the amount of quasi randomness you can use to actually improve things. Yeah, um, but yeah, quasi randomness. I guess. Yeah, I mean, it just yeah, it just I mean, a hundred different things, but depending on on uh, what you're trying to do. Um, right. Okay, so. What are we going to try to do today? Uh, so theorem. We'll try to prove the following theorem. Not quite proof, but basically give you a, a good idea of how it's proved. So an exponential improvement. So there exists epsilon such that this is true for large. What kind of one is that? Oh, yeah, thank uh, So we get something like, uh, something like epsilon, so there's like, uh, like 2 to the minus 7 or something <coughs> from, 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 from our proof. If you, so there's various optimizations that happen, and if you just kind of, if you actually follow those through uh, with more care, potentially using a computer, then you could improve this somewhat. But, I mean, not anywhere near 3, say. You right. could maybe get to 3.9 or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, there's, a, there's a, a limit to how far it can be taken. Okay. Okay. So maybe uh, I think I need to look at this actually. Okay. So what's the what's the strategy? So we're not going to use quasi randomness to do something something different. An approach, uh, a different approach that was suggested uh, by Thomason, and I think maybe even even maybe predates it, is that <coughs> the idea is you want to look for uh, a book. So what is a book? So a book is just an object that looks like this. So we'll be looking for red books. <coughs> Let me get some red. Give me just a clique and a complete bipartite. So here, for example, we have uh, a red book. Yeah. And uh, semi, uh, uh, second registry. So okay, so, so where is this 4 coming from? The 4 is coming from the fact that every time we put a vertex here or here, we lose a factor of 2. And to get one of these guys to be size k, we need to take k steps here and k steps here. So we're losing like, we're losing like a two, two k times. So what we'd really like, I mean, so, so when is it sharp? It's sharp when 
every, in every step, you have half red and half blue. Or maybe you have one extra red, so you take a red step and one extra blue, so you take a blue step. It's kind of stupid, right? You should, you should just want to take, if it's always half and half, why don't you just take red steps? If you just took red steps every time, you'd be in a much better position, right? So the problem that happens if you try to do that is, okay, I'm taking a bunch of red steps, maybe the red degree gets, goes down by a lot. It's no longer half, it's like a third or something. And then it's really painful to take red steps. So your enemy can really force you to take blue steps if he wants to. Okay? So it turns out you do win a little bit by considering things like this, but only a polynomial factor. Okay? But what Thomas has said was, well, look, I mean, let's suppose you could find a book with t vertices here and 2 to the minus t times n vertices here. Suppose you could take t step red steps in a row. Right? And let's suppose that t was large. Let's suppose t is like a constant times k. If you could do that, you would already have won. Why? Because you could just apply any Sekerish inside here, and there would be enough. So what's the claim? The claim is that 2 to the minus t times n is bigger than 2k minus t choose k minus t, which is bigger than the Ramsey number, k versus k minus t. Ah, so I didn't prove this. This was what was actually proved by addition second. Ah. Set, set, k rash, k somewhere. So what does Eddie Sekerich actually prove? Ah, so maybe I'll actually state this, sorry. Apologies. This one. And I'll stay here. So we do this. Um, so Edison Sekerich also proved. Uh, yeah. Edison Sekerich oh, it's exactly here. They also proved the Ramsey number KL which is when you want either a red clique of size k or a blue clique of size l, is at most k plus l to that. Okay? All k and l. Okay, this is, this is if you want a red k k or a blue k -L. And how do you prove this? Well, you just use induction. So it's basically, it's basically the same argument as this. Right? Uh, except if you really want exactly this bound, you should be a tiny bit more careful. So instead of just taking the larger of the two sets, if you've taken lots of red, if, you're, if your k is much bigger than l, you really want a different threshold. So what should we do? do? Do so you just ignore the constant minus one minus two or uh, no? So the threshold should actually be about l divided by k plus l. Oh, what I mean is the sorry. like oh sorry yeah there's yeah, a minus yeah. two oh, sorry minus two and minus one yeah I mean it's was correct inequality yeah <laughs> I mean so, so perhaps I'll uh, perhaps I'll put it in yeah okay so you basically do this except your threshold is not now a half. Your threshold is, is L over K plus L uh, times X and K over K plus L times X. Okay? And you basically get this. Okay. So, yeah, I should say, we also prove that Ramsey KL is at most e to the minus some constant times l times this term uh, for all uh, l at most um, But today I'll be focusing on focusing this. Okay, so why is this good? Right, so now 
you see that this bound, the ehrlich eckerich bound, you get from this very simple argument here, right, is exactly is exactly this. Right? Okay, so and so why is this true? Uh, if n is so this is true if n is at least something like e to the minus uh, is something like t squared over k times uh, times four to the k. Okay, so this is just a simple calculation, but maybe I won't bore you with with binomial coefficients. Okay, but you see that we've got a t squared over k here, so if you can get a constant times k here, you get a constant times k here, with a square, whatever. Okay, so this is the aim. We would like to find, or perhaps this is the first aim, because we won't actually manage to do this, but our first aim is to, is to try and, this is, this is the approach suggested by Thomason, to find these, this book of size t with, with this many pages, with those 2 to the minus t. If you could do this, you'd have the result. Okay. Oops. So let's attempt to do this and fail, and then we'll see how we can actually actually succeed nevertheless. So we're going to try and build this book using an algorithm. The algorithm is really surprisingly simple. So I, well, the main thing I'd like to explain to you today is what the algorithm is. So I hope everyone understands at least what it is, and then I'll talk a little bit about how you analyze it. Okay. So it's called a book algorithm. Okay. So I want a picture. The picture's going to look a bit like this and be a little bit more complicated. So, what we're going to have, we're going to have, I think I'll do it a little bit over here. So. Okay. so, here is my set A, like in any set for H. And here is my set B. And here is x. Okay. A, B, x. Okay, so, so far, this is exactly that picture. Okay. And the only new thing is I'm adding a set y, which is going to be in the common red neighborhood of A. So, I'm trying to build this red clique and this blue clique, like in every separate. And I'm going to add vertices to A and to B from X like in every separate. But I'm also going to maintain an extra set y, which is my attempt at this book. Right? So I'm going to attempt to make the book out of a and y. Okay. So how are we going to do this? So we want to just decide, we're going to define, we're going to choose a vertex x, how do we decide where to put it? So the algorithm is going to have five steps. So I'll try to motivate them rather than saying them in order. So the simplest one is a red step, which is actually going to be number four. Okay. So a red step means that you pick a vertex x in here, and you put it in n. Okay. And then you shrink x, because it's going to be your, x, your new x will be the red neighborhood of, of little x in here. Put these guys. Your new y, because you put it in A, will be the red neighborhood of x over here. And B will say the same. So that's your, that's your red set. So when is this a good thing to do? Well, the first thing I'd like, so I only want to lose a factor of 2 every time. So I'd like this to be like a half of y. 
I also want this to be not too small, because I don't want to lose x too fast. But actually, I'm not too worried about this, because my t doesn't have to be so big. Okay, So I'm going to ask this to be at least uh, something, yeah, which I won't say yes what it is. Maybe I'll say, OK, so it's actually going to end up being something called 1 minus mu, Okay, whatever mu happens to be. So we're going to choose a parameter mu. You're talking about the ratio, right? Sorry? You're talking yeah, about the, the ratio. ratio, sorry, a proportion of x. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the third thing, and in fact the most important thing, is, well, I'm going to 1. So, so how does I choose this x? So I've only I've got density half across. Well, basically, if the density of red edges across is a half, and I have a decent chance of doing this, right? And this is the most important thing that I want. I want to only lose a factor of two every time. What I really don't want is when taking these red steps. So you remember in Henry Sekeresh, you might try to take red steps, but then the enemy will, will mess you up by decreasing the density of, of red. Okay? So you're going to lose more than a factor of two every time. What I really want is only to lose a factor of two in every step. So how am I going to do that? I want to maintain the red density across between x and y to be at least a half. I don't want the red density to go down. OK? So it's very important to me, in between this set and this set, that I have density at least a half, maybe minus a tiny bit. Okay? Maybe I can't control it exactly, but it shouldn't go down too much. Okay? So that's what a red set's going to be. I'm going to want to do this. OK, so how could that fail? There are various ways it could fail, right? So this set could be too small, this set could be too small, or this density could be too small. So the easiest one to deal with, oh, perhaps, I mean, so two of them are easy and one is hard, basically. So what if this, uh, this, this set was too small? Well, OK, I could make a different vertex. But what if all of the vertices here have, have density less than this? What if this, this is just like quite sparse in red? Which can happen, right? I have no control over it. OK, maybe I should take a blue stack instead. Okay? So if the density is small, I'm going to put a vertex in here. Okay? And actually, for reasons that will become clear a little later, I'm going to put lots of vertices here. Okay? There's number two, a big blue stack. So this is. This is if high blue density in X. And I'll be more, more precise afterwards what I mean by that. OK, so if you find you're in a situation, right, we do, we're going to run this algorithm, we have no control over what happens inside X. If we find us situ in a situation where we have high blue density, we're going to do, we're going to put a bunch of vertices in B. OK, that's our, that's our step. Okay. OK, so otherwise, we can find a vertex with high, high red degree here. OK, what about the red density over here? Well, I'm saying I'm going to keep the density at least a half. So typical, typically, a vertex should have this property. OK, but what if there are some vertices that have lower degree, red degree? What if the degrees vary by a lot? Well, that's not really a problem, because we can just delete them. OK? So at the start of every round, I'm going to do a degree regularization step. So I'll just, just delete uh, vertices with low red degree. OK? So any vertex in X that has degree <coughs> has too few red neighbors across, just delete it. Okay? What does that do? Well, it, it makes x smaller, which is bad, but it makes the density from the remaining set go up. So as long as we're careful, those two things will, will go in our favor. Okay? And it turns out we can we can do that. Okay? So so what we're gonna do at the start of each of each round, so these things are going to uh, have some arrows on them. So 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 1. 
<coughs> Atch's extra errors from two to one and from four to one I'll explain in a minute. Okay, at the start of every round, we're going to do degree realization. So we can basically assume that degrees are all constant. OK, okay so that's our problem either. Okay, so this set is big, this set is big. But what about this? This is the big problem. Right? How do we stop the red density from going down? Okay, so what if? We pick this vertex and we just see there's, there's fewer red edges here than we expect. Okay. So in that world, what we're going to do is something called a density booster. Okay, and so set three is just choosing this vertex x. So now we have the whole algorithm set up, just so, so this is red step, if uh, x is good, and this is if x is bad. Okay. So the only real things I have to tell you here are how we do a big blue step, which is easy, and how we do a density blue step, which turns out also to be easy. Okay. okay. So, before I tell you any details, is the, the very high level picture, does it make sense? Okay. So when you choose x, do you just have to control the neighborhood in capital X? Ah, so, that's so, 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 right. so, so yeah, so we, there, there are two things we want from x. Right. So, the fact we're at step three means that we didn't return to one, so we didn't do a big blue step. So you have so high, high red density, so there should typically be large. Yeah, so, so actually the property that we need here is a bit different. All we need is that there are lots of vertices of high blue degree. Oh, high blue degree inside X. Oh, if, if you did step two, if you have lots of vertices of high blue degree, then you would do step two. Yeah. Okay. So the fact you arrived here means you don't have that, right. which means almost all the vertices have high red degree. You pick one of those. Yeah. But you don't pick any one of those. So there's a slight complication that you, you, want, you don't want this set to be bad. So, so what you actually want is that the red density between this set and this set is good. Oh. And it turns out you can, you can find one that's, that's good. I'll try and explain afterwards. Okay. But yeah, so you choose x to have those two, to maximize the red density between here and here, subject to it having high red degree. Right. Yeah. It turns out that's, that's fine. So I'll, I'll try and explain in a, in a few minutes. Any more questions? So can you explain again yeah. on a step four? Yeah, so a red step, I mean, it's, in one sense, it's very simple. You just, you've already chosen x. If, so you've chosen x to have, have good enough degree here. And by step one, it has good degree over here. So you do a red step if the density of red edges between here and here is bigger than, only goes down by a tiny amount. And I haven't told you alpha is, and that's a kind of important and a non-trivial thing. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about alpha in a, in a few minutes. But yeah, so there's some threshold we can choose. Importantly, we can choose it. And it doesn't have to be constant throughout the process, such that, that if, the, if, the den if the red density is bigger than that, then we do a red step. Yeah, is like, mu less than half? Uh, mu turns out to be yeah, two fifths. Two fifths. Yeah, so the, there's some flexibility. It does, so <coughs> yeah, two fifths is not necessarily optimal, but it turns out that within a small range, it doesn't really matter, and it was a nice number that, that works. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not a good idea to take to be a half. But anything that's around two fifths is okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, Yeah, perhaps I'll try I'll try, I'll try and explain also why that's a, a sensible thing. We'll 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 I'll write some levers at some point and we'll see the, yeah. Perhaps some. So the neighborhood of X is three fifths of the whole size of X or vice versa? Uh, yes, exactly. So this set uh, this should be really like three fifths. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. The mu yeah, so 
Right, so yeah, perhaps I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll say, I'll say it later. Okay. okay, so. Uh, right, so perhaps let me first what the density boost step is. I think it's perhaps the most, the most crucial thing. And also explains a little bit about the choice of x. Uh, right, so let's suppose that you pick this x and it's got a red neighborhood which is, uh, it also sort of explains the, the choice of mu, so it explains lots of things. So you have your red neighborhood and your blue neighborhood. And your red neighborhood, if that's not even to say it, is like at least three fifths. And your blue neighborhood is smaller, it's like two fifths. Okay? Or maybe even smaller, we don't know. Okay? And now also, <coughs> x has a red neighborhood over here, which is size about half. This is greater than three fifths, less than two fifths, half. Okay. Let's suppose this thing is size. Let's call this thing thing beta. Now, we just said we don't take a red step. So if the density before was p of red edges, this is smaller than p minus alpha. So if that happens, I would like to find a bipartition, so to, to, uh, to replace x and y by, by subsets, such that the density goes up. So who can see a pair of sets in this picture whose density is larger than p? You can see them, right? They're right there. If this is small, this is big. Right? And that's it. Right? This has gone up by, this is p plus, well, it's actually a bit more than alpha, right? Because beta is, is smaller than 1 minus beta, so it's actually alpha times 1 minus beta <coughs> over beta. Right? And this, this ratio will be important. Right. Okay, so the density boost step is incredibly simple. We put x inside b, right? Because we're going to take we take the blue neighborhood <coughs> and we take the red neighborhood. <coughs> And our density goes up by a bit. Okay, so that's that's good because density went up. It's also it's bad in two different ways though. So one way it's bad is that instead of losing a factor of two fifths when taking a blue step, we lost a factor of beta. And maybe beta is very small. But what if we also gain here because the smaller beta is, the more density boost we get. Right. So it turns out that the worst beta for us is actually smaller than two fifths. It's not equal to two fifths. It really does hurt us a bit. But it doesn't get much smaller. It's like 80% of two fifths or something. Okay. okay. The other way it hurts us is potentially more serious. We went into this subset of the right hand side. Right? So we lost a factor of two on the right hand side without adding a vertex to A. So this dream of 2 to the minus t is now gone. Right? Every time we do this density boost step, we lose a factor of 2 on the right-hand side. Okay? But the density's gone up, so okay, perhaps, we, perhaps we can we can <coughs> it. Okay, so that's what a density boost step is. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, so I cheated slightly. Yeah. So how did I cheat here? I sort of said it earlier when answering a question. Yeah, answering your question. <laughs> and the density between this set of size one half is not necessarily p. Yeah, exactly. P is the density between the whole of the left and the whole of the right at the beginning. 
But when I'm doing this argument here, I'm saying it's, I'm pretending the density between x and this set is, is p. So it turns out that just by a very simple convexity argument, which is literally just counting paths of length 2 that go here to here to here in red, you can show that on average, uh, the, the density between the red neighborhood of x and, and, and the whole of the left hand side is at least p. Okay? So you literally just count paths of length 2, use convexity, and it falls out. Okay? You mean there exists this x? No, I mean on average, the average x. Every so if you sum over all of them, then. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so, right. so therefore, there exists an x, but. We have to be careful, because I wanted x to also have high red degree here. So how do we deal with that? Well, now I should maybe tell you about the big blue step. So the big blue step. So this is density boost. Density boost. Oh, I have one question. So, yeah, so you after boosting the density, then yeah. you put these uh, red neighbors to B? Or? Uh, so density boost, I put x into B. X into B. Uh, uh, I replace I replace x by the blue neighborhood, so it's okay. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm allowed to, but I also replace y by the red neighborhood of x, even though in this picture I didn't need to. Right. But I do it in order to to boost the density. I see. Okay. Yeah. Mm, I know you probably get to it later, but how much can you afford to lose in the t? Like, how, is you're going to get two to the minus t plus. Yeah. However many density boosts, and roughly, like, what could what would kill you in terms of if, just if you were plugging it in, just if you plugged it into this <coughs> equation? I don't know if that's actually what you're going to end up. Doing. Right. So it, it it depends on the size of t. Ah. Yeah. So if there are, if there are s of these steps, perhaps I give it away already. So we will prove that s is at most beta over one minus beta times t plus little ok. Now, um, you might argue that this is a, a beta that doesn't depend on the steps. This was a beta particularly for this step. This beta is the harmonic mean of these betas. Okay. Okay. Uh, this turned out to be, yeah, this is the bound that we use. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we also want that t is at least something. And yeah, so perhaps I'll get to the end to see exa exactly. So it's, it's, yeah, it's not. It's not trivial how these things interact with each other. But I'll draw some pictures at the end. Okay. Yeah, we'll show what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. I should stop at 5.30, right? Okay. Yeah, so perhaps I won't tell you so much about big blue steps, but so big blue steps. I'll perhaps just tell you the condition that you need. So when can you do a big blue step? Well, what you need is at least Ramsey k l to the two thirds vertices whose blue degree and the blue whose blue degree is at least mu times x, where mu is going to be for us two th two fifths. Yeah. So mu is two fifths. Why is that a good thing to have? Well, just to say very roughly, if you have this many vertices, you either have a red clique of size k, so you're done, or a blue clique of size l to the two thirds. Now, just by double counting, look at the expected, so sorry, now you take a random sub clique of this, of size much smaller, let's say l to the one fourth, and look at the expected number of common neighbors of that guy. Double count. What you find is you get this blue book inside x of size l to the one quarter, and so let's call this s. And this is basically mu to the s times x. Okay. So this very simple double counting argument, that I guess I don't have time to tell you in detail, but it's literally just an exercise gives you, if you have lots of vertices with this min degree, 
you can take not just one blue step, but lots of blue steps. So you can put this whole thing, this whole blue clique, in B, and replace X by this symbol. <coughs> and it's paid for itself because you're just going down by a factor of mu every time. Okay. So the use, why is this useful? Because it means that, so the problem with doing this is you have no control of what this set is, or what this set is. So these might all be the vertices that have the lowest red degree to the right-hand side. Okay? So whatever in this, you're doing this deep regularization, you might, that's, that's your, you lose that density, which is scary, except because this is such a big step, you just do very few of these, and so it doesn't matter if they're painful. So each one of these is very painful for you with the, with the loss in red density, but there's very few of them, so it's fine. Right? Ah, sorry. I didn't say what L was. Ah. <laughs> sorry. L equals K. Okay? So any, any time I... Uh, so really, we're doing, I'm doing this in the, in, with L and K different, but just pretend L is K. Whenever I forget, L is K. Sorry. And mu is beta or not? Mu is not beta. Mu is fixed. Beta is, suppose, so, so mu is what you decide, what decides if you do this or not. If you don't do this, then you pick a vertex that has density, blue density at most mu. Beta is its actual density. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, so I think I should stop telling you about the, the steps and tell you about how to analyze a bit. So I'll answer the, the previous question. OK, so I'm going to write down some lemmas, which are not so difficult to prove. This will take some pages to prove, but, but nothing is difficult. But nothing, nothing in this proof is difficult. Right, it's, mm -hmm. like, it, it's a collection of very easy steps. Right. Okay, so let's have some numbers. So number one, how large is y? Well, um, so we start out with some density. And maybe I'll call the density we start out with uh, P0. Okay. And every time you go into the right-hand side, you go down by a factor of, of p0. Or maybe I'll just write a half, whatever. Okay. Maybe I'll just write a half. Fine. So two, you lose a factor of two every time. You lose every time you take a red step. So they're going to be t red steps. So we have t of these and s of these. You lose a factor of two every time you take a red step or a density booster. There's going to be some error that's size uh, little OK, and then when you start. Okay. So this is this is just follows from from what from okay. So why does this follow from? This follows from the fact that I claim we do control the red density. Ah, and I realize I didn't tell you how we do that. Maybe I'll tell you in a second. But if we can, if we stop the red density from going below half, then we get this. We also want to control the size of x, because that tells us how long we can go on for. So when does x go down? x goes down by a factor of mu every time we take a blue step. Uh, L is, yeah, very much write k. Every time we, I'll, I'll write L, just because and you can, you can see where it comes from. So the size of B will always be at most L. The size of we're looking for a blue particular size L. We go by a factor of 1 minus mu every time we take a red step. Right? We only took a red step when we had at least 1 minus mu neighbors. And we also lose a bit more every time we do a density boost step. Because the density boost steps, as we saw down here, go down by beta instead of mu. So we also lose a beta over mu to the power s times n. Okay. And again, there's a 2 to the little ok. Sorry. Maybe I'll just ignore the 2 to the little ok's. Okay. 
So this also follows just by, so, but it's, it's so not difficult to prove. You need to worry a little bit about, uh, right, you just average the betas. It's an AMGM. This is, this is and number three, what I said before, we're going to bound S in terms of T. So why is this? This is just because in these density boost steps, we go up by a factor of 1 minus beta over beta times the amount we go down. So in red steps, we go down by alpha. In blue steps, you go up by alpha times 1 minus beta over beta. So it's very natural that S would be this much smaller than T. Okay. All these things are like completely natural. Okay. okay, so what happens if you if you try to analyze this, this sequence of three inequalities? What happens is you get a picture like this. Okay. This is T, which goes between 0 and K. And this is S which goes between 0 and, well, I guess like a bit smaller, like 0.7 times k, whatever, and k over 4, something like that. OK. So you don't, we don't control beta, but there's like a, the enemy controls beta. And what this means is, if you sort of plug these calculations into the computer, what you see is you end up with some region that looks like this, <coughs> where you know you'll end up. Okay. So we don't control exactly what t is. We don't know how, how, far, we, how far the process goes. We just run the process until we run out of vertices and x. And the enemy can mess us up by making beta smaller. Right? By making beta smaller here, we make x disappear quicker, which means t will be smaller. Right? But if the enemy chooses beta smaller, it also forces s to be smaller. Right? So there's some trade-off uh, that the enemy gets to decide. It turns out that you end up somewhere in this region. Okay, okay now the question was, when is it enough? Right? We no longer have 2 to the minus t, we have 2 to the minus t minus s. When is this bigger than this? Well, again, you can just plug in the computer, and you get some region that's good for you. And the region looks like this. What I mean is, so we want t to be bigger, that's good for us, so red is bad. So blue is where we end up, and red is bad. And as you can see, these two areas overlap in a narrow strip that's around, this is like, uh, like 3k over 4. Okay, and this is like uh, 4k over 9 or something. So basically, we run the algorithm and we win unless we happen to be unlucky and our enemy chooses beta correctly so that we land, land here. Okay. So actually, this proves something terrible. It proves a bound on the Ramsey number that's like slightly larger than 4 to the k. Okay. <coughs> so we lost. That was very sad. <laughs> okay, so can you all suggest uh, a way around this problem? Those who were listening carefully last week uh, can probably do so. You already sketched the idea, right, last week? Yeah, so okay, people who were listening carefully last week know. <laughs> people who weren't listening carefully can, can have fun guessing. So, this guy here, is what you get by applying any separation. Right? So this is saying that uh, 
q to the minus t minus s is this inequality here, right? So we could make this red area smaller by improving this bound. If we improve this bound, then we could put something smaller here, and then this would be more likely to be true. Okay. So what we need is, okay, so t is roughly 3k over 4. So what we really want is to improve, yeah, what we really want is to prove this with L being roughly k over 4. Okay, so let's try to prove that. Well, everything is the same, except now we only want a blue clique of size L, which is like k over 4. <coughs> and we can change this 3 fifths to 1 minus mu. And it turns out now what we'd like mu to be is not. Uh, do this, it's like L over K plus L. It's, it's what I said before, you get from the Eddy separation. <coughs> so we're at the same argument with mu being this guy. All these lemmas are the same as before. But where is our advantage? Why, why if we failed if we fail in the diagonal case, why would we succeed in the off-diagonal case? Why are we better off? Well, it's right here. Because our mu is now much smaller, instead of being, uh, it being two fifths, it's now more like one fifth. It forces our beta to be smaller, which forces our density boost to be bigger. So instead of, of having just, you know, slightly fewer uh, uh, density boost steps than red steps, we now have a lot fewer. And what this means is, when we do exactly the same argument, but with L smaller, these sets are disjoint. So we win by some chunk, and then applying this here, this moves this line just a tiny bit, and now these things are disjoint. And perhaps I can show you a picture. So I probably should have uh, asked you slides for five minutes. But, uh -huh. <laughs> I can show you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't uh, plan this very well. <laughs> but Do you want to connect the computer? Uh, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> here we go. This is from a talk I gave in, in China the other day. So this is the outcome of the algorithm. This is that picture over there. And this green bit, this green bit is that yellow bit. That's how small this, this overlap is. <laughs> right? You can barely see it with your eyes. If I, if I zoom in, yeah, there's a zoomed in version. Like, it really I is there. It really is there. Okay. Then, when we improve it, Instead, we get this picture. And you see very clearly that they no longer <laughs> intersect. <laughs> very clear. There you go. Maybe you can see now. We zoom in, they really don't intersect uh, by that much. That's how much we win by. OK? That's the proof. The proof, the proof is the picture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the proof. Exactly. Yeah. Ah. OK, and I'll give you a nice picture of myself and Julian, and I should stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Because what do you mean proof is the picture? Everything you trust computer or...? Oh, no, so yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, right, so I think as a, as a reader, then when you see the picture, so it's just a numerical, it's a numerical claim. So we have a lemma that we need, and, and right, and if you put it in the computer, you see that, you see that they're disjoint. We actually, in the, in the appendix of our paper, we give a careful proof. So we reduce it to basically maximizing some one variable function, um. which you can then do in Wolfram or Python or whatever. Um, yeah, but basically it's, it's some numerical claim that just says, 
Right, that th this this implies some region, some region you have to show these two regions in the district. And what is your opinion? Should such paper contain already such appendix? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to make a universal statement. I felt I felt in this case that it was necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't want to, uh, to to force someone to believe a picture. Yeah. Hmm. In the uh, in the off diagonal case, then um, that we yes, in the far off diagonal case, you can just write down a, a proof that someone can read, either, like without worrying about any of this stuff. In the sort of uh, yeah, in the close diagonal case, then it's slightly more complicated. And you have two variable functions, and uh, you can't just do it by picture. Um. So you figured out the you improved the off diagonal case first. Is that right or? Uh, yes, right. So what actually happened was that we were trying for a very long time to, to prove the diagonal case and failing. Um, and, uh, and then the, uh, the suggestion was to, uh, to try to just do off diagonal instead. And we realized it worked much better. And then miraculously, we discovered that actually it can be pushed all the way. Right. Yeah. It was, I mean, it's sort of. It's sort of totally luck, this, right? I mean, uh, sort of thing. <laughs> there's no reason that it should break at exactly that point. There's no reason it should break just before, but if it's going to break just before, it should break by enough that you can't fix it. But it turns out that you can. It's, it's sort of so by some miracle that it, that it works. It looks like these are convex, so do you find some linear function that separates them? Uh, yes, so, so the way we prove it is we just literally draw a line through here. And uh, things increasing in that direction, decreasing in that direction. Yes, yeah, so uh, they're monotone in. Yeah, so you just show on this line, uh, they're both positive or negative, whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a like a, a page or something. It's not it's not difficult to, to prove. <coughs> just pick, pick the correct line. Yeah. Do a little bit of calculus. Nothing complicated. Yeah, so the thing I didn't tell you uh, was how you choose alpha, which is actually sort of interesting and crucial. You don't choose it to be constant. You choose it to depend on your current value of p. So it might be that your enemy, so what you really want to do is you want to put like a, a floor underneath um, what you allow uh, alpha to be. So this is your sort of original p0. You don't want to let it go down below this. Right? Maybe this is a half, whatever. So what you say is basically you begin by taking alpha to be really, really tiny. Um, so it would be kind of crazy for your, for your enemy to push it down. So your enemy sort of is, is forced to push you up a little bit. And then you increase your alpha exponentially. So I guess it's all linear in P, but sort of uh, exponentially in the number of steps. And then it reaches some threshold, some sort of some level at which it's sort of sensible just for the enemy to keep it there the whole time. So what you do is you increase your alpha sort of linearly with p. What it means is that your enemy cannot do more than log k density boost steps in a row. So if they did, you'd end up with density one. Okay, so sort of the crucial thing in the analysis is really the choice of this, this function alpha. It's not a, yeah, it's not a constant. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I didn't tell you anything about the space yeah. spheres problem, but perhaps we can discuss. Okay. Yeah. If, if people, anyone is interested in high dimensional spheres, then I'll, uh, I'll perhaps do a, po a post seminar. Seminar. <laughs> <laughs> is your theorem uh, true for universe all k or large k? Uh, so large k. Um, I think for small k, uh, yeah. I mean, so for small k, stronger thing, really small k, stronger things are known. Uh, I mean, in some sense, if you, so if you, if, if I state it like this, if I state there exists epsilon, uh, and don't write this, then I it's before I'm wrong, right? Yeah. Then you can choose yeah. that. <laughs> so yeah. when you say epsilon is 2 to the minus 7, then, you're, exactly. then, then you may have to assume the case large. Exactly, yeah. But probably not crazy large, 10 to the 10 or something. We didn't, we're not, we weren't careful about it. Do you expect that uh, there will be a simpler proof or like who proof? <laughs> <laughs> right. So so uh, later. I, I feel like the the book proof 
uh, will come via this conjecture about high dimensional spheres, mm -hmm. if it's true. That really feels like the correct way to do it. I feel, I feel like this, this is the correct way to do perhaps the very far off diagonal, which is much simpler. So if you, if, you, if you allow your L to be much smaller than K, all the, all the horrible analysis disappears and, it's, it, and everything is very beautiful and simple. Um, but for the diagonal case, like I said, I really feel like it's just luck, but it, it works at the diagonal. And the correct proof should be something which, which explains better um, this, this sort of interaction of randomness and structure. That, but I mean, the reason why this problem is so, is so beautiful is it's saying something about how much structure you could hide in random objects. And, and our proof sort of gets around doing that in a way that I don't find really satisfying. I think that this, uh, this, this other, other approach that we were trying for a long time is really the, the correct way to do it. Yeah, we just weren't able to push it through. But I'd say there's also lots of beautiful problems about more colors and about hypergraph Ramsey and things all. I think this is really sort of the, just the you know, start of a, a, a big adventure. Any other questions? So if not, let's thank the speaker.